Thank you, Karen. Yeah, financial peace uh, is probably something a lot of folks are looking for. That kind of peace and other kinds of peace in life as well. Oftentimes, peace doesn't come because of the fears that we have. And I've been reflecting uh, on that fact, and so um, I have made a decision to preach a three-part series beginning today entitled, Facing Your Fears. And I'm going to be talking about not, not, not things like being afraid of bugs or snakes or a fear of heights, but deeper fears, deeper fears within us and fears that are common to many of us, some fears that maybe we don't even articulate because they're so deep. And starting today, I want to talk about the fear of insignificance, facing the question, do I matter? Do I make a difference? Is there anything about me that's special? And even in God's eyes, do I, do I matter? I'm struck by the many ways that people in this life look for significance, look for ways in which they can matter or belong. I was reading that last year in 2014, Americans spent 11 billion, not million, billion dollars, 11 billion dollars on cosmetic surgery. Tummy tucks, facelifts, augmentation of body parts, all so that we can look better, to feel better, so people will like us, so we'll feel like we matter. I've always found it amazing that we like to wear clothes with someone else's name on it. You know, designer clothes. It reminds me of the movie Back to the Future. Did you ever see that movie? Michael J. Fox goes back in time uh, to when his mother was a teenager. It was kind of a scary thing for him, and he kind of crash lands into the, the past, and she's calling him Calvin, and he finally says, why do you keep calling me Calvin? She said, because it says on your clothes, Calvin Klein. That, that's your name. Yeah, why, why would you have someone else's name on your clothes? Well, because if it says Tommy Hilfiger or someone else who's famous and cool, um, that makes us feel better by association. So I matter because I have their name on my clothes. How about that, huh? And I dare say, not everybody, not in all cases, but for some, it's part of the reason why we have offspring, why we have children. Because we hope that in that way, in becoming a parent, we'll feel significant, that there'll be someone who will love us, someone who will one day grow up and say, my mom was great, my dad was terrific, and we'll, we'll have a legacy We'll leave something lasting behind so that after we're gone, someone will be talking about us. So we'll, we'll matter. And some people who have more money than they know what to do with will establish a foundation so that long after they're gone, there'll be a statue somewhere or a big plaque in a park that says, this is the Joe Schmo Park. And they know in their minds that decades after they're gone, little children will play around a Joe Schmo plaque and they'll be remembered. These are only a few of the ways that we look for significance in life. I want to tell you this morning that the good news is you matter. You matter. You are significant. I love Jan's children's message. Wasn't that great? What's, you know, God's greatest creation? Look in the mirror. Yeah, it's you. It's me. And how do I know that you're significant and that I matter? Because the Bible tells me so. I want to point out a couple of verses in Matthew's gospel, chapter 10, where um, Jesus is actually, this is sort of his pep talk, with the disciples 
because uh, in a little bit, they'll be sent out to do uh, the work of the kingdom. And Jesus is kind of getting them ready. In chapter 10, he calls the disciples and he gives them some advice. He says, you know, um, you're going to face some struggles. Well, Jesus said at another point, in this, in this world, you'll have tribulation, right? Boy, is that true. Whether you're one of those 12 or you're a disciple today, there is tribulation. He said, but don't be so worried about people that can kill the body. Sounds like a reference to what would happen to the disciples in later years where they would be persecuted for their faith and even tortured and killed. He said, but be worried about the one who is responsible for your body and your soul. He starts to talk about fear. And then he comes to the point where he says in verse 29, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. There it is, a direct statement. Don't be afraid. Don't worry that you're not significant. God knows who you are. He knows what you are. And he loves you anyway. <laughs> and that's a good thing. More than a couple of sparrows. Even the hairs of your head are numbered. That's kind of crazy to think about, isn't it? Now, it doesn't take as long to count for some of us, but... <laughs> Jesus is going over the top, way out of his way to point out the fact that God loves us by using these kinds of examples. A little sparrow falls to the ground, and God knows about it. God's aware of it how much more you matter. But you know what the deeper question is, I think? The deeper question is, why does God care? Because it only makes sense that God would care, I guess. I mean, even if you're not a big believer in God, you would say probably by definition, if there is a God, that God is good and God loves but the deeper question is why? why? Why is God so in love with you and me? Why is Jan's children's message so true? That if you want to know what God really cares about, look in the mirror. Why? Why does he care? The Bible tells us that as well. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, is a great statement for us. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We're God's workmanship. He made us. That's why he cares. You know, this past summer we had a terrible storm and a lot of folks had damage to their property. Well, if you were one of those really handy people who would want to put an addition on your house and you built this addition yourself and a storm like that came around and knocked a, a tree over and it landed on your addition and smushed it, you'd be upset for a number of reasons, but on one level you'd be upset because you built it, you made it with your own hands, you created it and now it's destroyed. The artist loves what they create. It's part of them. And the Bible says that we're created in God's image. And in that way, we can love like God. We can receive love. We can forgive. You are God's idea. Hey, I think I'll make a Sue or a Robert. Yeah. Someone has said that if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. Why? Why? Because you're his workmanship, created for good works. You're not saved by good works. You're created to do them to honor the creator so that when people see you, the creation, they think of God because you're made by God. And your purpose is to worship God. That's your purpose for being on this earth. 
to worship God and serve God, to reflect God. Do people see God when they see you? I have a friend, his name is Art, which is a good name for a fellow who's an artist. He carves birds. If you're a bird lover, you might know what kind of bird this is. It is a lesser yellow leg. And that's about all I know about <laughs> this bird. My friend Art is an artist, and he carves these birds. And um, I knew him from another place in ministry, and I remember going uh, to visit him one day, and he said, would you like to see my workshop? I said, sure. So he took me back, and he has this amazing workshop. It's like a converted garage. And um, every tool you could imagine for doing this kind of work. Now, Art started doing this uh, just, you know, kind of because he loves it and, and still does uh, for that reason. But he's so good at it that he, he gets calls from all over the country and gets commissioned to do birds. Uh, there's some really, people really into birds out there, uh, and they say, can you carve for me a lesser yellow leg, you know? And they'll pay thousands of dollars for a bird that he'll make. So when he gets commissioned, he starts his research. He gets out all these bird books he has in his workshop, go on the internet, and he finds out all about the bird, about the bird's habitat. Where does the bird live? Because when he makes a bird like this and has it sitting like on a piece of wood, he wants that wood to be just like the wood that would be in that natural habitat for that bird. That's how specific he is. And he's got all these special tools to get the feathers just right and all the right paints to be able to paint it. You see a seashell there because this bird evidently uh, hangs out by the, by the ocean. And... Uh, I was blessed for years to be his friend because, you know what? Every Christmas, I got a bird. <laughs> so if you ever want to stop by my office here, you'll see a shelf, right, Becky? The bird shelf. I have a bunch of birds, and uh, they're beautiful. And when I would talk to Art about his birds, and when I would uh, take that little tour in his workshop, boy, to see his face glow and radiate, and to see how thrilled he was to present to me a bird because he made it. He was the creator, and that was his creation, and he was invested in it. It was part of him. As I look at these birds on my shelf, I think of him all the time. That's how it works with the creator and the creation. That's why you matter. God's in you. You're made in his image. He thought of you. You were his idea. And he placed you here for a purpose, to serve. And when you embrace that idea and that purpose, God can do great things in you. And that's where the fulfillment comes in your life. Up to that point, you and I, we live for ourselves. We want to be happy. We want to be in that comfort zone. But once we realize there's something bigger than you and me individually out there, and we're plugged into it, life changes and becomes bigger and more beautiful than it ever could otherwise. And we let go of the fear of insignificance because we realize it's not about me. I'm part of something much bigger, part of a huge God, a loving God, caring God. And what I find amazing is that somebody's gone through the Bible and counted the number of times the phrase fear not appears. And it appears 365 times, one for every day. So today, I want to challenge you and encourage you and invite you to go forth to live your life by faith. Live it for Jesus Christ. Understand that you are significant. No matter what the world has told you, no matter how you've been treated in the past by other people, God is invested in you. So go forth and fear not. And when fear does begin to creep in, claim the name of Jesus. Claim your heritage. Claim the fact that you are God's 
handiwork, his workmanship, so that fear might not be a resident in your life, but maybe only a visitor. God, thank you for loving us in such wonderful ways. Thank you for caring for us and making us the way we are, all different, all unique. Thank you for the gifts and talents you've given us. May we be good stewards of all that we are. May we go forth to live our life in you, not in fear, but with a spirit of boldness, knowing that you not only made us, but you are with us always. And even when this life ends, we will be with you as we live in you. All this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, would you stand and uh, join us in closing the service in a time of praise?